the 26th of February, 1966. The last rites of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, a man who never sought fame or position, a man to whom death had little meaning, one who believed that the spirit of man is indomitable. Savarkar was born at a time when the echoes of 1857 were still in the air, an uprising which he was to explicitly define as India's first war of independence. <laughs> British imperialism had all but dominated the subcontinent when in the village of Bhagur near Nasik on the 28th of May, 1883, it was in this house that Savarkar was born. He was to embody the spiritual revival initiated by Swami Dayanand and the revolutionary fervor of Vasudev Balwan Sadke, both of whom died at about this time. Young Vinayak was brought up not only on epics, such as the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, but on the courage and love of freedom of men such as Rana Pratap and Shivaji. Even as a child, Vinayak read newspapers to know what was happening in the world around him. In 1897, a plague epidemic struck Western India. The plague could not have come at a worse time because famine starved the land. While efforts were made to contain the epidemic, there were many instances of unwarranted cruelty by the British authorities. Houses and belongings were burnt indiscriminately, and people were evicted and dragged away from their homes without any sympathy. Bal Gangadhar Tilak, in the Marathi newspaper Kesari, asked in bold headlines, whether the government had lost its reason. The silence of terror ruled the cities and towns. There was a great outcry against the special plague commissioner, W.C. Rand, who instead of working in the plague-ridden areas, preferred to spend his time at government house especially while celebrating Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Returning from the celebrations after midnight, Rand and Lieutenant Iris were shot dead. The killer, the Chapekar brothers, were caught and hanged. The effect on Vinayak was one of indignation and rage. The young boy took a vow. I will fight unto death for the freedom of my country. Savarkar wrote a stirring poem on the martyrdom which was published and widely read. People found it hard to believe 
that a 15-year-old boy could write such a moving poem. Moreover, they were astounded to discover that the youngster was also an effective orator. In Nasik, whereas the crowds went to pray, Savarkar came to pay homage to this bell, which was captured by the Marathas from the Portuguese in a bitterly fought battle. It was in Nasik that Vinayak began his secondary education. With his newfound purpose, he joined his elder brother, Baba Rao Savarkar, to start the Abhinav Bharat, a group devoted to shaping a rejuvenated India. From an original gathering of five, the movement spread rapidly to different parts of the country. The Abhinav Bharat believed in total freedom. Each individual could contribute to their goal in different ways. By writing, by arousing, by publication, by revolution and martyrdom. After matriculating in 1902, Vinayak went to the Ferguson College in Pune. This is the room he occupied in the college hostel. Apart from the books prescribed in the curriculum and the English classics, Savarkar studied Indian culture and history in great depth. Here again, Savarkar introduced the Abhinav Bharat. In spite of the fact that the college authorities disapproved of political discussion, Savarkar encouraged and indeed promoted it. As a student leader, Savarkar often called on Tilak for discussion and guidance. In 1905, every political leader was apprehensive about the impending partition of Bengal. The people of India reacted strongly. Savarkar and his fellow students organized a bonfire to burn cloth from Lancashire. This symbolic burning of the British Raj upset the college principal who fined Savarkar 10 rupees and had him turned out of the hostel. Tilak denounced the college authorities. They don't deserve to be our teachers. At about this time, Savarkar came to know of a patriot living in England, Shamji Krishna Verma, who was offering scholarships to dedicated young people. Savarkar decided to apply. My dear Pandit Shamji, according to your instructions, I enclose herewith the agreement on stamped paper signed by Mr. Savarkar as per your draft. I remain yours sincerely, Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Even as Savarkar sailed for England, the special department of the government sent a confidential warning to the India office in London to keep an eye on the activities of the young firebrand. Savarkar had made it clear in his scholarship application that he would go to England not only to become a barrister, but basically to continue his fight for India's freedom. This building in Highgate in London was named Bharat Bhavan, India House, by Shamji Verma. 
Savarkar lived here and began to read for the bar at Gray's Inn. Never one to waste time, Savarkar promptly started to recruit people for the Abhinav Bharat, many of whom were later to make history. In 1907, while the government observed the 50th anniversary of the crushing of the mutiny and the saving of the British Empire, Savarkar celebrated the occasion as the Indian National Rising of 1857. People whom the British thought of as rebels were recognized as national heroes. Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Rani of Jhansi, Nana Sahib Peshwa, Tatia Tope, Raja Kumar Singh, and other martyrs. It was in this India house that the flag of a free India was designed. Savarkar gave the flag to Madame Bhikaiji Kama and Sardar Singh Rana to take to the International Socialist Conference at Stuttgart in 1907. Madame Kama's appeal to free one-fifth of the human race from the bondage of imperialism evoked a tremendous response from the socialist leaders of the world. In India, fearing a wave of revolt, the British closed down presses and imprisoned national leaders. The repression in Punjab was particularly brutal. <laughs> Reacting to this violence, at the Imperial Institute in London, a member of the Abhinav Bharat, Madan Lal Dhingra shot Sir Curzon Wiley, the most powerful man in the India office. Dhingra was imprisoned and hanged in Pentonville prison. Before he died, Dhingra said of his country, my wish is that I should be born again of the same mother and that I should die the same death for her again. Winston Churchill said of Dhingra's last words that they were among the finest ever spoken in the name of patriotism. India House was closed down and Savarkar and his friends went away from London. At Brighton, Savarkar wrote a poem which expresses the longings of perhaps every revolutionary in exile. He appeals to the great ocean to carry him back to the feet of his motherland. <laughs>
Back in London, Savarkar continued his self-appointed task. Whenever he could get away from Gray's Inn, he read all he could of colonial history, through the ages from Roman times to the British. At the India Office Library, he managed to get access to confidential correspondence and military dispatches between India and London. After exhaustive research spread over nearly two years, he wrote the first historically authenticated account of the Indian War of Independence, 1857. The secret services had kept a close watch on Savarkar, and his book was, if not the first, certainly a very rare example in the history of literature of a work being proscribed before its publication. The book continued to be officially proscribed until India finally became independent 38 years later. The book was clandestinely published in Holland, bound in covers purporting to be the works of Charles Dickens and Walter Scott. It was translated into French, German, several Indian languages, and was smuggled to many countries of the world. Meanwhile in India, Vinayak's brother Baba Rao Savarkar had published a collection of poems urging total revolution. He was arrested in Nasik and condemned to transportation for life. Vinayak's younger brother Narayan Rao was also arrested and imprisoned for promoting the idea of freedom. In retaliation against the savage treatment meted out to revolutionaries, the collector of Nasik, A.M.C. Jackson, was shot dead by Anand Kaneri. Kaneri was hanged. It was established that the pistol was sent to India in a book by Savarkar from London. On his arrival at Victoria Station from Paris, in March of 1910, Savarkar was arrested. He was detained in Brixton Jail. It is interesting to note that whereas England had sheltered Mazzini, Karl Marx, Garibaldi, Kossuth, Lenin, and other revolutionaries, De Valera and Savarkar were treated differently because they were under British rule. Savarkar was shipped out to be tried in India. In Marseille, Savarkar eluded his guards and in the early hours swam ashore. and taken back to the ship. This led to the famous Affair Savarkar, an arbitration case before the International Court of Justice at The Hague, where France claimed that Britain had no right to take Savarkar out of French jurisdiction. However, by this time, the High Court of Bombay indulged in a remarkable travesty of the British rule of law. There was no jury at the so-called trial of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, and he was denied any right of appeal. A special tribunal was hastily appointed, even though France and England were still arguing the question of jurisdiction at The Hague. The charges were those of waging war against the Crown, of abetting the murder of Jackson, and of sedition. It is noteworthy that there is no record of this mockery of a trial in the law report. Savarkar's property was confiscated and he was sentenced to imprisonment for life, not once, but twice over. The British gave Savarkar the honor of taking him to Port Blair in the Andaman Islands in the SS Maharaja although the conditions in which he traveled was not exactly royal. Mm. 
The Andamans were the devil's island of the British Raj. To be sent here across the Kalapani, the black water, meant never to be returned to life. of the cellular jail was designed to frighten the life out of a convict. When Savarkar arrived, not a single prisoner was allowed to see him. There was constant fear of Savarkar's volcanic presence. It is a terrible irony that Vinayak did not know that his elder brother Babarao was also imprisoned here at the time of his arrival. He had known that he was in prison, but not where. It was only six to eight months later that he was to know of his brother's presence. His younger brother, Narayan Rao, was also in jail on the mainland. The three of them, brothers in life, brothers in prison, brothers in the cause of freedom. But tragedy and sorrow were never to overshadow Savarkar's spirit. In the extremes of solitude, he was beginning to develop an inner strength, a spiritual defiance of all that the material power of an empire could do to him. The chains and confines of prison meant nothing. His mind was free to be with his God, to be with his great love, his motherland. A life sentence in those days usually meant 25 years. So Savarkar had 50 years of incarceration to look forward to. To begin with, he was placed in solitary confinement for six months, a measure designed to demoralize him. To heap indignity on solitude, he was informed that the Senate of the University of Bombay had withdrawn his degree of Bachelor of Arts, an act of petty viciousness which caused many Britishers to hang their heads in shame.
At no time was Savarkar treated as a political prisoner, always as a criminal. During the Delhi Darbar in 1911, to celebrate the coronation of George V and Queen Mary, while officers of the Raj and Indian toadies paid homage to the crown, freedom fighters seemed to have been forgotten, but not entirely. On this august occasion, while many prisoners were released and others had their sentences remitted, not so Baba Rao and Vinayak Savarkar. No doors open for them. On the contrary, Vinayak was kept in a cell from which he was compelled to suffer the sight of the brutality of his captor. Vinayak was kept in crossbar fetter a system unknown in India, a barbaric punishment for minor infractions of prison rules. He was handcuffed and kept standing for seven days because a note from another prisoner was found in his cell. Savarkar himself has described the solitary monotony of many years in a cell. And yet while his body lay shackled, his mind roamed across the sea climbing hills, flitting like a bee among flowers, searching for visions of those close to his heart, marveling at the beauty of God and the infinite variety and epic vastness of India's history. He scratched poems on the walls, because the walls were periodically whitewashed and the poems he wrote were obliterated. He committed them to memory, a prodigious task for he composed more than 10,000 verses during his years in jail in the Andaman. After eight years, Vinayak finally met his wife Yamunabai and his brother Narayan Rao. They had traveled 1,500 miles to see him for 60 minutes on one day and 75 minutes on the next. He received news of the death of Baba Rao's wife, Yashubai, who was as dear as a sister to him. She died neglected because she was the wife of a convict, an unsung martyr. One form of punishment for rudeness to a jailer was to have to extract 30 pounds of oil a day. Savarkar was only one of hundreds of revolutionaries who suffered inhuman treatment. Who can measure their contribution to the freedom we enjoy today? Among others, Maxim Gorky, wrote of Savarkar and his colleagues that they generated a new spirit of hope which was making obsolete the English regime on the banks of the Ganges. The poor food and the harsh punishment inflicted upon him was too much even for Savarkar's strength. He collapsed.
Lying in the sick bay when death seemed imminent, he yet summoned up reserves of determination, for he refused to give in. How could he die before he saw his country free? On the 1st of August, 1920, Bal Gangadhar Tilak died in Bombay. When the news reached Fort Blair, Savarkar organized a day of fasting in tribute to the great leader. Not a single prisoner touched his food that day. There was a demand throughout India and in other countries for the release of the Savarkar. The British authorities decided to transfer Baba Rao and Vinayak to the mainland. Vinayak was brought to Ratnagiri to another top security jail. Here he was given some amenities. His first action was to put down on paper the thousands of verses he had composed and memorized in the Andaman. <laughs> In 1924, Savarkar was released on condition that he should not leave Ratnagiri district and that he should not indulge in any political activity. A breach of these conditions would make him liable to imprisonment again. <laughs> Savakar decided to devote himself to social welfare, especially to attack the narrow-minded practices of orthodox Hinduism. Untouchable children were kept out of classrooms. Savarkar's solution was typically radical. Integrate them. He asked his wife, Yamutai, to call the women of the neighborhood, irrespective of caste, for holding the Haldi Kunku ceremony. After centuries of neglect, outcast children and women began to feel that someone cared for them. Yeah. 
Savarkar opened for Harijans the temples hitherto closed to them. Savarkar contributed to the simplification and precision of the Devanagari script. He arranged and encouraged inter-caste eating to break down caste barriers, a movement which spread and came to be called Sahab Bhojan. In 1927, Gandhi came to Ratnagiri and called on Savarkar, who lived opposite to the house where Tilak was born. They were meeting for the first time since Savarkar's student days in London. In his house in Ratnagiri, Savarkar devoted himself to writing. He wrote his memoirs, he wrote on Hindu philosophy, he wrote plays and many works devoted to the restructuring of society and the equality among people necessary for a viable civilization. At last, in 1937, Savarkar was released unconditionally. The day of his release, the 10th of May, was coincidentally the date on which India's first war of independence began. On acquiring freedom of movement, Savarkar undertook a long journey to every part of India. He was received by huge and enthusiastic crowds not only as a Hindu reformer, but as a foremost patriot and revolutionary. Savarkar had a clear idea of his view of the future. While fighting against the British Raj, he said, before you destroy anything, you must know what you are going to construct in its place. He said, India must be independent. India must be united. India must be republic. India must have a common language and common script. And that language should be Hindi and that script should be Nagari. That republic should be a national form of government in which sovereign power rests ultimately and uncompromisingly in the hands of the Indian people. When the Second World War broke out, Savarkar saw an opportunity to militarize the youth of India. He felt that a trained and disciplined force would be able to choose the direction in which to point their guns. It is not the gun that fights, but the hand behind it, and not even the hand, but the heart behind it. In June of 1940, Subhas Chandra Bose conferred with Savarkar in Bombay. The details of that meeting are not known, but it is a fact that Subhas Bose's idea of a military insurrection became known only after that date. The Indian National Army, led by Subhas Chandra Bose, first hoisted the flag of freedom on Indian soil. Fittingly, the flag was first flown over Port Blair in the Andaman, where India's revolutionaries had suffered and died. The British left India. Freedom had arrived at last. Vinayak Damodar Savarkar was for the first time in his life a profoundly happy man.
was a time of imperial glory. The British Empire was thought to be imperishable, the best of empires in the best of all possible worlds. Beyond this facade that lay the reality that was India in poverty. Amid the pomp and ceremony, beyond the glittering civility of the Indian nobility, there was being born the idea of revolution. There was the policy of divide and rule and repression. Ironic situation indeed. A storm was brewing and it was not to die out till freedom came. The hearts of the people were stirred by passionate leaders. Lala Lajpat Rai and Ajit Singh were deported to Burma. In exile, Ajit Singh thought of home and did not know that in that very year, 1907, his brother's wife had given birth to a son. His name... Rajan Singh, Bhagat Singh's grandfather, his three sons, Kishan Singh, Bhagat Singh's father, and the two younger brothers, Ajit Singh and Swaran Singh, were well-known patriots who had agitated and fought for liberty. A family tree of patriotism to nourish the little boy who was to grow into a symbol of the young who die with a smile for their country. Bhagat Singh's mother recollects. When Bhagat Singh was a child, he used to tell his aunt, when I grow up, I'll drive away the English and bring uncle home again. The First World War broke out in Europe. Why should Indians die in a war between imperialist powers? Revolutionaries made plans to oust the British from India and this resulted in the Lahore Conspiracy Trials. Twenty-eight revolutionaries were hanged, among whom was Kartar Singh Saraba. When asked to appeal against the death sentence, Saraba said, Why? Had I more lives than one, I'd give them all for my country. Of scaffolds and heroism, Bhagat Singh heard much. This when he was eight years old. Then the Gandhian epoch in history began. The nation was stirred. The Rowlett Bill provided for arrest and trial without due process of law. Gandhi and the people demonstrated peacefully against this fascist move, and they were answered with brutality. Was non-violence the answer? When a man beats you with a stick, why not hit back? Thus he thought of what he saw, the child Bhagat Singh. Then General Daya wantonly fired on a crowd of unarmed Indians in Jallianwala Bagh. The official British estimate is that 379 persons were killed and at least 1,200 wounded. mad violence Bhagat Singh saw when he was 12 years old. In 1921, Gandhi launched a non-violent, non-cooperation movement. Although Bhagat Singh, at 15, had seen more violence than most of us see in a lifetime, he curbed his natural desire to fight back and volunteered for the non-cooperation movement. Suddenly, 
national leaders were arrested and thrown into jail. More than 30,000 people were imprisoned. Retaliation against brutality, a crowd had attacked a police post at Chaurichora. Hearing of this instance of violence, Gandhi immediately called a halt to the movement. Bhagat Singh returned to his interrupted studies. He joined the National College at Lahore. Although he was writing to his grandfather about his grades and marks, he was thinking in terms of socialism and revolution, in which Sukhdev, Bhagwati Charan, and Yashpal were his comrades. The Russian Revolution had taken place and the world resounded with the names of Marx and Lenin. About this time, the Akalis protested against the existing administration of Gurdwaras. Their demonstrations were peaceful, and yet the police were merciless in their suppression. At last, Bhagat Singh concluded that against such violence, violence was the only answer. The city of Kanpur was the headquarters of the Hindustan Republic Association. Its aim was to establish a United States of India through armed revolution. When Bhagat Singh joined the party, he was 17. In dire need of funds, the party organized a daring robbery. The revolutionaries held up a train at Kakori, near Lucknow, and made off with the government money kept in a strong box. But the leaders of the party were arrested. Four of them were hanged, and four of them sentenced to life imprisonment. With the near disintegration of the party, Bhagat Singh returned to Lahore. He was one of the founders of the Naujawan Bharat Sabha. It stood for socialism and direct action against foreign rule. In October of 1926, some miscreants threw a bomb during a Ram Leela procession in Lahore. The police suspected revolutionaries and Bhagat Singh was arrested and tortured in jail. A bond of 60,000 rupees was demanded of him. The High Court found him innocent and he was set free. In the shadow of the ruins of Feroz Shah Kotla, there was a concord of revolutionary leaders. Largely under Bhagat Singh's influence, the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association adopted as its goal a socialist republican state to be achieved through mass action. 1928, a year of intense political activity and turmoil all over the country. The youth of the country was answering the call of Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose. <laughs> then came the Simon Commission, composed of seven Englishmen, to judge whether India was ready for self-government. The commission was boycotted and there were massive demonstrations against it. In one non-violent procession, the lion of Punjab, Lala Lajpat Rai, was brutally beaten by a police officer. He died of his injuries a few days later.
retribution was not long in coming. It came on the 17th of December, exactly one month after the death of Lala Lajpatrai. Assistant Superintendent J.P. Saunders lay dead. The three revolutionaries who had planned the execution, Bhagat Singh, Shivram Rajguru and Chandrasekhar Azad, escaped through the hostel of the DAV college which had joined the police office. Disguised as an official of the very government he strove to overthrow, Bhagat Singh took a train for Calcutta. He was accompanied by Durga Bhabi and her son. While Rajguru travelled as his servant, Chandrasekhar joined a band of pilgrims, ostensibly going to Mathura. Subhash Bose, Motilal Nehru, President of the Congress. While they were mobilizing the people, Bhagat Singh was meeting the revolutionaries of Bengal and organizing the manufacture of bombs in Agra, Saharanpur and Lahore. Suddenly, the British Raj declared war on labor. 36 trade union leaders were arrested and put on trial in an attempt, as Gandhi said, to strike terror into the hearts of working people. The revolutionaries, first and foremost, espoused the cause of the working classes. When the Trade Disputes Bill was passed in the Central Legislative Assembly, two bombs were thrown into what is today the Parliament House of Free India. The two bomb throwers, P.K. Dutt and Bhagat Singh, did not slip away. In the shocked silence, they spoke clear and loud. In Kalab Zindabad, down with imperialism. Bhagat Singh and Dutt were convinced that their martyrdom would do more than anything else to awaken the people of India to the realities of British imperialism. In the ensuing trial, Zafarullah Khan appeared for the prosecution and Asaf Ali for the defense. Bhagat Singh made a historic statement in defense, not of himself, but of socialism. He said, revolution does not involve the cult of the bomb and the pistol. By revolution, we mean that the present order of things, which is based on manifest injustice, must change. Though no one had been killed in the symbolic bomb throwing, B.K. Dutt and Bhagat Singh were sentenced to life imprisonment. Soon after the conviction of Dutt and Bhagat Singh, evidence was found in connection with the killing of Saunders and bomb depots were unearthed. Shiv Barma, Jaydev Kapoor, Rajguru, Jatin Das, Gaya Prasad, B.K. Sinha, Kishori Lal and other revolutionaries were arrested. B.K. Dutt and Bhagat Singh were also charged with a conspiracy to wage war against the king. In this, the Lahore conspiracy case, Bhagat Singh was considered the chief ringleader. All the accused refused to retain counsel for their defense. In jail, the conditions were so atrocious that the revolutionaries went on a hunger strike to press for better conditions. Jatin Das, a victim of police brutality, refused to break his fast and on the 63rd day of his fast, he died, a martyr in the cause of freedom. Subhash Bose arranged for his body to be taken to Calcutta, where 500,000 people attended his funeral.
At Lahore, the new Congress president, Jawaharlal Nehru, unfurled the tricolor, and the Congress resolved to struggle for Purna Swaraj, complete independence. Then came the great Dandi salt march, which stirred the nation anew. In Peshawar, 30 people were shot and Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, the frontier Gandhi, was thrown into jail. One by one, national leaders were arrested. In Allahabad, Chandrasekhar Azad was shot to death by the police. Meanwhile, the Lahore conspiracy case was prosecuted implacably. The British Raj indulged in one of the greatest travesties of the rule of law. And an ordinance appointed a tribunal to try the accused without the benefit of legal advice and without the right of appeal. On October the 7th, 1930, Bhagat Singh, Rajguru and Sukhdev were sentenced to death. For seven others, transportation for life. For the rest, varying terms of imprisonment. The judgment was not delivered in a court of law, but in the jail itself. Bhagat Singh's father asked the defense committee to appeal. Even Gandhi had little hope of a reprieve. But in 1931, the Privy Council, the highest judicial authority in the British Empire, turned down the appeal. Bhagat Singh asked the governor to have him shot instead of being hanged, as he was a political prisoner. The request was refused. In a letter to his younger brother, Bhagat Singh wrote, as the flame of the candle in the morning, I disappear before the light of dawn. On Monday, March the 23rd, 1931, at sunset, Bhagat Singh, Rajguru and Sukhdev were hanged. Their bodies were not given to relatives or friends for the last rites. In Talab, Zindabad, long live revolution. Long live the memory of young men who sacrificed their lifeblood for their motherland. There were many, there will be many more. One of them was Bhagat Singh. He was 24 years old when he died.